Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Josie, and I'm part of the public engagement team here at Alzheimer's Research UK. And I'm delighted to welcome you to the 13th event in our Lab Notes online series. Today, we're hearing from researchers from the University of Manchester, which is in our Northwest Research Network. They will talk about vascular dementia and the important link between your heart and circulatory system and your brain. But first, I'll just go over a little bit of housekeeping. So during the event today, you're welcome to switch on the automatic subtitles using the CC button at the bottom of your screen. They're not 100% accurate during the live event, but they will be edited, so they are correct on the event recording. If you've missed previous events, you can watch them back in your own time as they are all available on the Lab Notes webpage or on our YouTube channel. During this event, if you'd like to ask a question, you need to click the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, which will bring up the Q&A box where you can type your question. Please do su submit your questions throughout the event and we'll try to answer as many as we can in the Q&A sessions after the talks. So now we're gonna ask you a few poll questions because while we can't see you due to the online format of this event, we're really keen to know a little bit more about you. So these questions ask you for your reasons for attending today, to rate your current knowledge of dementia research, and hopefully you should be able to see those polls now. So how the first question is, how would you rate your knowledge of dementia research? So you can just uh, select your answers there. Which of uh, these best describes your reasons for attending this event? So maybe you have dementia or you're a friend or a family member has dementia. Perhaps you care for someone with dementia or you work in the field. Um, and maybe you're just here because you want to find out more about dementia research. And the final uh, question is, is this your first dementia research event? Um, have you been to one of our lab notes events before? So I'll just give you a few more seconds to answer. I can see everyone's voting now, so that's really great. Nearly there, I'll just give it a couple more seconds while we wait for a couple more people to cast their votes. And that's great. So hopefully you should be able to see those results on your screens now. So as we can see, um, most people have like an average knowledge of dementia research and that's great. That's kind of why we're here today. We want to help you find out a bit more. Um, it's great to see that some of you uh, are here because you've got a family or a uh, member or friend with dementia. And it's, we're, oh, that's fab to see that, that it's not all of your first events. So welcome to, to Lab Notes and we really hope you enjoy it. And for those of you that have been before, welcome back. We're really pleased to have you back. Um, and just before we hear from our researchers today, I'd just like to take a couple of minutes to talk to you about how you could donate to our charity by leaving a gift in your will. So I'm just gonna share my screen and share some slides with you. So hopefully you can see my slides. And uh, right now is a really crucial time in our fight against dementia. And here at Alzheimer's Research UK, our vision is a world free from the fear, harm and heartbreak of dementia. And particularly during the pandemic, we've all really seen how first, firsthand how the power of research can change the future. And people choose to support us in many different ways. And we appreciate all the support that you, that you provide. So whether you host a bake sale, you run a half marathon, maybe you give on a regular basis or make a donation in memory of a loved one, your support makes a real difference in bringing forward the day when we can discover a cure for dementia. So one in, third of all, one in three of all of our research projects are being funded by gifts that supporters have left in their wills. And this has enabled us con to continue our vital research, particularly throughout the pandemic. We offer a range of information and support around writing your will, including information about powers of attorney and also a free guide to writing and updating your will. If you have any questions or queries about gifts and wills, please head to our website and there should hopefully be a link in the chat now. And if not, there'll be one at the end of the session as well. So gifts in wills ensure that our work continues into the future, accelerating tomorrow's vital breakthroughs to protect future generations from the fear and heartbreak of dementia. Thank you so much for listening for that, to that little talk. And let's move on to the main focus of today. So at today's event, we're hearing from researchers from the University of Manchester in the Northwest Network. 
And this network is one of 15 that we support across the UK, providing funding for research, networking and collaboration, and also helping researchers to share their discoveries and progress with the public. Our speakers today will be talking about vascular dementia, which occurs when blood vessels in the brain are damaged. This means that blood flow to brain cells is reduced, which affects how they work. So first up, we have Dr. Adam Greenstein and second speaking is Kate Kellett. Once they've given their talks, I'll return to the screen and we'll move to the Q&A session. You can submit questions at any point during the event and we'll try to answer as many as we can in the time that we have. So without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Adam Greenstein. Over to you, Adam. Thank you so much, Josie. Um, I'm just going to start sharing my screen now. So um, welcome everybody and thank you for attending. My name's Adam Greenstein and I'm a doctor in Manchester and I deal with elderly patients and with high blood pressure. And I also run a laboratory looking at uh, how blood vessels in the brain work. And I'm proud to say that my work here is supported in part by Alzheimer's Research UK. And you'll be hearing a little bit about that today. So I'm gonna start off with quite a personal slide. Um, I've been a doctor for uh, 26 years now, and you never really forget your first patient, especially with dementia. Um, it was about 25 years ago. I was in Leeds in an outpatient clinic and somebody brought their wife in. She was having difficulty walking. Uh, she was having some urinary problems. He felt that her personality had changed. She'd become less interested, less able to do jobs around the house and her memory wasn't quite as good as it had been. We did a CT scan of her brain and there was lots of changes uh, consistent with blood vessel damage. And I spoke to my consultant and I said, so I think this is the picture. And he said, oh yes, she has vascular dementia. And I said, okay, uh, what's the plan? And he said, well, there is no plan. And you never forget those conversations that you have with the patient when you tell them that there is no treatment and the look on their face in terms of how devastating that is. And the rest of medicine has moved on over that time, but dementia treatment really has not. And I still have those conversations with patients on a weekly and certainly monthly basis. And that's why I do what I do here in Manchester. And so I'm gonna to talk to you today a little bit about the history of dementia to try and put this in context, because this is not a new problem. 4,000 years ago, doctors described memory loss, the word dementia, is over 200 years old and it comes from Latin, D, out of men's, your mind. Alzheimer's, of course, described this condition over 100 years ago. And in terms of vascular dementia, we've known about it for at least 50 years now. And over that time, our care for patients still consists of supportive care for activities of daily living because that is the ultimate treatment that you get for people with vascular dementia. And this is what we must change in the future. Now the clinical trials in dementia across Alzheimer's and vascular dementia, there've been over 400 clinical trials with a 99% failure rate, as many of you will know. There are medications which we can use and which we do use commonly. For example, the chylonesterase inhibitors such as donepezil, um, but these only reduce the symptoms. They don't alter the course of the disease. Recently, there's been the introduction and approval from the American Federal Drug Administration Board of aducanumab, which is a beta amyloid body, but this drug is mired in controversy and has not been shown to improve the overall course of the disease. Now, 
what this does really beg the question about all of the negative trials that why have they been negative and one potential answer is that all of the drug the trials have actually targeted the nerve tissue of the brain so the nerve tissue of the brain is known as your neurons and i'm sure that many of you will have heard this word before neuron means nerve cell but what if this is the wrong target could this explain why so many of the drug trials have been negative because when people talk about brains they think about what the brain looks like and you will generally have this picture of your brain in your mind uh, you can see that it's a folded compact uh, organ comprising multiple nerves but in fact when people like me think about the brain i study blood vessels this is what i see now this is a cast on your left hand side of the screen <clears throat> excuse me of uh, all of the blood vessels in the brain and if you zoom into this you can see that there is a tangled intricate ubiquitous web of blood vessels throughout the brain starting with these large arteries which we call peel arteries which run across the surface of the brain and then they plunge down into the surface of the brain they're known as parenchymal arteries arterioles these then proliferate to form the capillaries now you may be surprised to know that there are over a thousand miles of blood vessels in each brain. In fact, there are more blood vessel cells than nerve cells. And all of these blood vessel cells are working overtime to facilitate a process called neurovascular coupling. Now, what do I mean by neurovascular coupling? There's a very complicated picture on the uh, slide here, and I apologize for that. But the, the message that I would like you to take away from this is that um, when you think or when you do activities, so for example, when you're listening to me, the area of your brain, which is the processing part of your, your brain, requires blood. You may be sitting down. The part of your brain which deals with the motor functions of your arms or your legs doesn't need the blood at the moment. The blood needs to be directed to the areas of most need. Blood vessels, believe it or not, sense the activity of nerve cells in the brain. They sense when the nerve cells are active, so they will be sensing now the activity in your brain that you're looking at the screen and you're listening to my voice. And those parts of the brain, the blood vessels will sense that the nerves are active and they will be reacting to that activity by increasing blood flow to those areas. So it's neurovascular coupling. And as we understand that the blood flow to the brain is so important in tandem with this, the door opens a little bit in terms of our treatment because in 2018, almost 50 years after we started talking about vascular dementia, the SPRINT MIND study was published in America, which reported that lowering blood pressure intensively prevented the onset of memory loss and dementia by at least 15%, if not more. Now, the importance of this cannot be understated. This is the first ever drug study which has shown a preventative nature in dementia, irrespective of Alzheimer's or vascular dementia. So the first ever study to show that we could prevent dementia came from a cardiovascular study, not a neuronal study. And of course, this makes complete sense because like I said about the patient who we saw at the beginning of our talk, the brain scan shows extensive small vessel disease consistent with ischemia, that means lack of blood to the brain. Now, a lot of people think about arteries as just being tubes. 
But you will know now from what I've been telling you is that these are not just tubes throughout the brain. They are very sophisticated detection organ systems. They can detect when nerve activity is occurring adjacent to where they are, and then they react to this. And in this way, arteries are like little mini pumps, and they've got lots of very complicated layers from the inner endothelium to the vascular muscle cells, which is a bit like the pump of the, of the heart. Now, I've got this video here for you of an artery which we've been studying in the lab. Now, arteries, they sense pressure inside them, and then they squeeze. Now you can see here, we've got a very small artery which has been magnified about three or 400 times. And as I put apply pressure within the artery, the artery wakes up. You can see here, the top line is the diameter of the artery over time. The artery senses the pressure and then it squeezes in response. And it's this capacity to sense pressure, sense nerve activity, and then react to that that forms the basis of how we all live, how arteries supply blood, oxygen, and nutrients to the tissues. And if we look at arteries even more closely, we can see that this squeezing capacity, this reactive capacity of arteries, precisely depends on a very sophisticated signaling complex within the arterial cells themselves. And what you're looking at here is an artery face on, and we've taken a slice right through the middle of it. And each one of these little strips here is an individual cell. And you may be able to see some flashing lights in each artery, in each cell. These flashing lights are release of calcium from within the artery and that they control the activity, how hard the artery squeezes and how hard it doesn't. So let's talk a little bit about what brain arteries actually do. They control the blood flow to the brain and they direct the blood flow to an area of the brain which are active. Now we know that in Alzheimer's and vascular disease, there's reduced brain blood flow it predates the diagnosis. So before you have your memory loss, you have a reduction in blood flow to your brain. And if you do have a reduction in blood flow to your brain, you get a more severe form of dementia. And we also know that in patients who do have Alzheimer's and vascular dementia, you, you lose the ability to direct blood to specific areas of the brain damaged. So the question that we're working on in Manchester is could blood vessel damage in the brain be partly responsible for dementia itself? In order to do this, we, amongst other models, we study an Alzheimer's dementia mouse model. Now this is a genetically modified mouse, which exactly replicates the genetic mutation which is found in a very specific family in Sweden, a set of families where they overexpress a protein which is known to accumulate in the brains of people with Alzheimer's disease called amyloid precursor protein. And I'm sure you'll be hearing a lot about this later on today. But these mice have memory impairments and they show amyloid beta build up by six months of age. And really excitingly, what we can see and what others have seen is that this protein, which is responsible for the brain and blood vessel damage to Alzheimer's, appears to congregate in these pink areas in the slide here around the blood vessels of the brain. It's causing an impairment of the function of the arteries within the brain. Now I've shown you some images of calcium imaging. We've done lots and lots of experiments on these mice and we're working really hard on this project and we're really excited about where we're up to. But what it shows us is that in the healthy control mice, which don't have excessive amyloid and don't show features consistent with Alzheimer's, they have a normal 
pattern of calcium signaling within the artery. However, in the Alzheimer's mouse, which you will see here on the right, I hope that you will be able to see by comparing the videos before that there's a much more wavy pattern of constant calcium waves throughout the cell. And when we look at the function of the cells, we see that their ability to do all that blood pressure squeezing and regulation and dilation and delivering blood to different parts of the brain of the mouse is completely altered. And this is what we're working on so far, because most of biological discovery and biosciences discovery hinges on the understanding of uh, pathways in our body. And we find this pathway whereby we see a reduction in calcium signals within the arteries of the mouse model with um, Alzheimer's to cause more contraction in the arteries. So these mice are showing what we would perceive to be a vascular type of dementia. The reduced flow will be occurring in reaction to the higher contraction of these arteries. Now, from a, from a development perspective, it's extremely exciting when we start to think about damage to blood vessels. And if I can demonstrate this to you, I want to show you what's happened in the last 20 years in terms of the heart and blood vessel damage to the heart. If you go into hospital now with a heart attack, bear in mind that a heart attack is caused by a blockage to a blood vessel supplying the heart. And dementia is caused similarly by damage to blood vessels within the brain. But if you go in with a heart attack, you will have one, many, or even all of these interventions, and you can subsequently go on to live a normal life after a heart attack. From my perspective, the arteries are the answer. High blood pressure and indeed Alzheimer's disease call, cause small vessel disease of the brain and dementia. And it will only be by understanding how this is that we will move on from this terrible cycle that we appear to be in, in which we keep trying new drugs targeting the nerves of the brain, but we're not solving the arteries. And I would say that at this point, I'm probably about halfway through my career. I don't want to be having these conversations with people when I, when I finish in 20 years time. Um, and it's through organizations like Alzheimer's Research UK, where we're going to find the answers by doing the science and changing the way that we treat people with Alzheimer's and vascular dementia. And with that, I would like to thank you very much uh, for, uh, uh, for your attention. And I would like to hand over to uh, my colleague, Dr. Kate Keller. Thank you, Adam. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'll just share my slides. Right, so um, I'm a postdoctoral research fellow at the University of Manchester. And I've been doing research into primarily Alzheimer's disease for around the last 15 years. Um, but more recently, we've moved into looking at vascular dementia. And today I'm going to present our work looking um, using human stem cells to study vascular dementia and show how more recently we've adapted these models to start looking at the effects of COVID-19 infection in the brain. So our body is made up of lots of different types of cells, as I'm sure you all know, and these cells come together to form the different systems in the body. And these systems allow our bodies to function. 
And the blood system and the brain system meet at what's called the blood brain barrier. And as Adam has told us, this is key to events that cause vascular dementia and also other dementias such as Alzheimer's disease. So in the brain side of the blood brain barrier, we have the nerve cells called neurons, um, which are the action cells of the brain. These allow us to think, make memories, um, act on our thoughts. But also in the brain, we have other support cells, and these are cells that keep the neurons healthy. There are three main types, um, the astrocytes, which regulate what goes into and out of the neurons, the microglia, which are shown here in red, um, and these are the immune cells of the brain, so they help fight infection in the brain. And then these other cells depicted here in purple, which are called oligodendrocytes, and their role is to insulate the neurons. Um, neurons pass their signals electrically, so much as you would um, insulate electric, electrical wires, the neurons are insulated to allow those signals to pass through quickly. And that helps our brain to function the way we need it to. On the, the vascular side, the blood side of this blood brain barrier, um, we have our blood vessels that Adam's talked about. And these are um, surrounded, if you like, by what we call a, um, barrier cells. And these are really important in maintaining a, a, a separation between the blood and the brain and protecting our brain and only allowing things into our brain that we want to be there. Surrounding these barrier cells, we then have muscle cells. And this is what Adam talked about with the muscle cells regulating the blood flow to the brain. So all of these together make up the blood brain barrier and that allows our, blood, our brain to function correct, correctly. So what happens in dementia? So normally, as, we, as we've talked about, this, this barrier system prevents unwanted substances from getting into the brain, but it also allows um, delivery of things that we need to pass across, such as oxygen and nutrients to allow the brain to function. So oxygen and glucose are delivered to the brain to give the cells the energy they need. But also importantly, the waste products that are formed by the cells as they perform their functions are allowed to cross back into the blood and be taken away from the brain, therefore keeping the cells healthy, preventing a buildup of waste products. So the barrier protects the brain, keeps, keeps all the cells in the brain healthy, and everything is really carefully balanced. And this is the neurovascular coupling that Adam explained earlier, where activity in the brain and the blood flow in the brain are very tightly, tightly linked to allow function, functions to carry on as we would want. So what happens in disease? Well, in disease, there are small, subtle changes in blood flow, such as occur in vascular dementia, which results in a mismatch between the activity in the brain and the blood flow. And these changes can come from a variety of different factors, including aging, but also um, lifestyle habits such as smoking or other diseases such as diabetes or stroke and hypertension. And when you get the mismatch of the, of the blood flow and the brain, you can you get a buildup of harmful substances. So not only do the cells of the brain not get the nutrients that they need in the same um, way, but they also, when they perform their functions, they create these waste products, which then don't get removed as effectively from, from the brain side. So less is being delivered, but also less is being cleared. And eventually this, this buildup of products can cause damage to the, to the cells. It not only causes damage to the cells on the brain side, but it can also cause damage to the, to the vascular side of the blood brain barrier. And what happens is as you get damage to the, to the barrier, you get further leakage of products that you wouldn't want into the brain. And this starts to cause the cells to become unhealthy. You get this um, breakdown of the blood brain barrier and eventually the cells start to die. And this is what potentially causes dementia. And it's, as Adam said, it's a very early um, thing that happens in dementia, both in vascular dementia, but also in other dementias such as Alzheimer's disease. So how can we really investigate what's going on? And this is what we're trying to do in our lab at the moment. So how do we study cells in the brain when they're really quite hard to access? Um, and 
the way we do this is we use something called stem cells. Now, stem cells is something that you've probably all heard of. They are an amazing resource as stem cells is what we, we all start out as. And stem cells are able to, um, to, to become any cell type in the body. They have the ability to grow into any cell type. But stem cells are normally associated with development, with a development of a fetus into a baby. And they're not available to us as adults because we don't have these stem cells anymore. But in 2006, it was discovered that if you take cells from an adult, you can reprogram them much as you would reprogram a computer by changing its software. You can reprogram a, stem, um, a human adult cell and make it turn it back into a stem cell. So you can take a really accessible cell like a skin cell or a blood cell, reprogram that cell and make it into a stem cell, which you can then grow in a plastic dish in the laboratory. And then if you have stem cells, what you can then do is grow all of the different cell types that you want to study. So for us, we can grow the barrier cells, the brain support cells, the muscle cells and the nerve cells that we need to generate um, a blood brain barrier model, which is shown here. So how do we do this in a dish? How do we put all these cells together? Well, it's as simple as taking a, a, a little plastic dish, if you like, and layering these cells in. So we can put the barrier cells in with the muscle cells in underneath. And then on the, the brain cells, we can put our nerve cells and our support cells together to create almost Oh, a blood side and a brain side. And these pink areas here basically show the liquid that we keep the cells in. So we keep the cells in a liquid which has all the nutrients in. And then we put these dishes inside an incubator to keep the cells warm and give them lots of oxygen to grow. But what we can do once we've got this model is then start to disrupt things either from the blood side or the brain side and start to see what happens to the different cells in our model. So that's what it looks like in a diagram. What does it look like in the lab? So once we've made the different cell types, we can put them into our model and then we can use a special microscopic technique which allows us to visualize the cells. So here we have the blood vessel barrier cells on the left and the brain nerve cells on the right. So this is as if we are looking down, um, down on top of the cells. And on this side, we've seen that the outside of the cells green and what you can see and the inside of the cells blue, sorry. And what you can see is these cells grow and grow so they all grow next to each other. And you can see they form a barrier. So there's no gaps between the cells. And that's what forms the barrier part of our blood brain barrier. The nerve cells are shown here in red. You can see they're much more spider-like with these sort of spindly um, bits reaching out. And they're the bits that, that allow the nerve cells to communicate with each other. But you can see they look very different to the, to the barrier cells. And when we layer these on top of each other, we can then look from the side, so much as we would be looking at on this um, diagram here, and we can see the red nerve cells at the bottom with the barrier formed across the top of the, of the green barrier cells. And this is how we, we generate the model that we can then use to investigate disease. So at the moment, we know that Alzheimer's disease, um, there's a protein called amyloid that Adam mentioned that's um, involved in, the, in Alzheimer's disease. And we've been able to show in this model that if we um, inhibit a specific protein which helps in the breakdown of amyloid in the, in the neurons, that we can actually start to see the buildup of amyloid plaques that you get in Alzheimer's disease in this model. And this is the first time that anybody's really been able to see that, that amyloid depositing in the cells without genetically altering the cells um, to give them a genetic form of the disease. So that's going to allow us to start investigating what causes Alzheimer's disease when you don't have a specific genetic mutation. And then in, in terms of vascular dementia, what we're, we're doing is we're using different ways of disrupting the barrier, disrupting these barrier cells, and then looking at whether we can protect the nerve cells of the brain um, from, from that barrier dysfunction. So that's what we're working on with this model. But the good thing about having these sorts of models is that they can be adapted to answer different questions. 
And most recently, we've taken these models and have been looking at um, what might happen in the brain with COVID-19 infection. So it's become clear as infection numbers in have increased um, and the effects of the virus have been documented that some people suffer with brain effects as, as a result of contracting COVID-19. And particularly people with long COVID have often experienced what they would describe as a brain fog. Um, there's also some evidence to suggest that infection with COVID-19 might initiate some changes in the brain that are similar to, to dementia-like changes. But how the virus gets into the brain and how it causes the damage which might in, um, accelerate the, the, the onset of dementia isn't really understood. So we were able to get some money and using our models to study um, how COVID-19 might affect the brain. So to do this, we first started off with, with fairly simple models. So we can grow each of our different cell types from our stem cells. So initially we just grew the cell types, each, each cell type on its own, um, with the idea that we'd make the more complex models later, excuse me. Hmm. So we grow, the, grow an individual cell type in, in a dish and then infect these cells with a COVID-19 virus. Now this virus um, has been cleverly modified by colleagues in the lab to have this little, um, if you like, tag on it that allows us to look at where the virus has gone. And it, it emits a, spe a specific kind of light that we can detect um, to see where that, that virus is. So we leave the cells for two days once they've been infected. And then we have a look to see whether any of our cells have the virus inside them by looking at this specific um, light source. And what we can see is if we infect the support cells and nerve cells of the brain, and then the barrier and the muscle cells of the, of the vascular side, we can start to look at which of these cells become infected. So infected cells um, come up red. And so you can clearly see that the support cells of the brain become infected with COVID-19 after they've been infected for 48 hours. There's some um, infection in the nerve cells, not as much in the support cells, there's less cells infected. And then very little um, infection in both the barrier and um, the muscle cells of the vasculature. So brain nerve cells and brain support cells seem to be infected by the virus but barrier and muscle cells of the vasculature don't seem to be infected. So it is important to say that the amount of infection is relatively low. So compared to if you infected a lung cell, you see much less infection, but that's not necessarily surprising seeing as less people get um, brain effects as a result of infection. But it is really interesting to help us understand what might go on in the brain and cause that brain fog that's, that's described. The lack of infection in the barrier cells and muscle su cells suggests that these particular cells may not be as susceptible to infection. And other data we have um, does suggest that barrier cells in particular have really high defense mechanisms against virus. But what if the barrier was disrupted and the virus could enter the brain um, through the disrupted barrier? So, this is really new data and has led to us having lots of other questions to answer. And what we're hoping to find out over the next six months is, does the virus itself disrupt the blood-brain barrier? Um, and if it does, does it cause damage to the barrier itself directly or potentially indirectly? So we know that there's a big immune response um, following COVID-19 infection. And is that, that response to the, the virus responsible for disrupting the blood-brain barrier? What happens to the cells of the brain when they are infected? So even if the virus doesn't disrupt the barrier, it may be that it can still cross the blood-brain barrier um, due to there being a, a slightly leaky blood-brain barrier from other factors such as age and lifestyle um, and disease. So if the barrier is already damaged, can the virus then get into the brain? And what then happens when the brain's infected? Does infection of those cells cause dementia-like changes? And then finally, 
We want to determine whether infection in the brain, even at low levels, could then cause further damage to the blood-brain barrier. So if, if this damage to the blood-brain barrier is really key for dementia, um, would COVID-19 infection in somebody who had already been predisposed to having damage um, really exacerbate that and, and cause dementia earlier? So that's what we're looking to investigate at the moment. That just leaves me to say thank you very much for listening. Um, to acknowledge all of the people here who have been involved in this work. And um, I believe if you've got any questions, um, Josie is now going to lead us in a Q&A session. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kate. And thank you, Adam, as well. Hopefully, um, yep, yeah, we're all back on the screen now. Um, thank you both. They were both really fascinating talks, really, really interesting to hear about your research. So thank you for spending the time to give us those talks today. We've had a few um, questions uh, pre-submitted before our event. So I'll start off with those first. So um, Adam, maybe this first one will be for you. Have you looked or do you know anything about the roles of genes and genetics in vascular dementia? And does this type of dementia run in families? So um, the, uh, that's a really interesting question. So uh, thanks to whoever's posed that. Um, there is not a great deal of genetics which is involved in vascular dementia. <clears throat> However, there are one or two very rare conditions affecting about one in 50,000 people who do get problems with their blood vessels to cause dementia and this is a condition called Cadacil and this is a condition that obviously runs in families and it causes problems to how small blood vessels work in the brain. Um, the reason why this is uh, useful for us to study as a condition is because, because only one gene has been deleted or modified, it shows us the role that that gene plays in terms of how small arteries function. And it turns out that this actually could be uh, an avenue for us to pursue treatment. But the majority of vascular dementia is related to your blood pressure. Okay, thank you. Um, Kate, maybe one for you. Um, we hear a lot about uh, amyloid when we're talking about Alzheimer's disease, um, but what is there a link, if any, do you know between uh, amyloid and vascular dementia? Um, so potentially two links, I think. So amyloid is one of the waste products in the brain that's produced that's normally cleared. So we all have amyloid in our brain constantly being produced, but also constantly being cleared. Um, the genetic forms of Alzheimer's disease, you have an increased amount of, of amyloid, but how you get the extra amyloid in your brain um, in non-genetic Alzheimer's disease is thought to be due more to the clearance of the amyloid than the production of the amyloid itself. So when you then get the, so it, when you've got less clearance, you've then got more amyloid around in that new, in that blood brain barrier space and the, the amyloid can cause um, the breakdown of the barrier. So that's the first one. The other one is that amyloid is actually produced. Um, there is a form of the disease, cerebral amyloid angiopathy, where you actually get amyloid deposits in brain, in blood vessels, sorry. So there's actually a specific type of amyloid disease that's associated with blood vessels. So it does play a role. Okay, cool, thank you. Um, Adam, maybe another one for you. Um, what level of hypertension is considered a risk for dementia and is variable hypertension a problem? That question's come through today from Alison. So um, again, this is a, a, a great question because it actually goes to the heart of one of the biggest controversies in blood pressure management globally at the moment. So the SPRINT study, which I alluded to, was done in America. And as a result of that and many other studies, they have redefined what their acceptable level of blood pressure is or the level at which they define blood pressure to be raised at 130 millimeters of mercury, which is the top figure. So you know when you do a blood pressure reading, you get two figures, you get a top one and a bottom one. So you might get 140 over 90. So in England and in Europe, we diagnose high blood pressure as being above 140 over 90. 
Certainly, any level above this will be detrimental to your brain. The figures from the American study indicate that as your blood pressure goes above 130 even, there is evidence that it could be damaging the small arteries in your brain as well, which is partly why they've redefined the boundaries of high blood pressure. And even in Europe now, um, the European Society for High Blood Pressure has recommended that if you are on treatment for high blood pressure, if you're able to tolerate the treatment, your blood pressure should be below 130 when measured in clinic. And that is where my blood pressure is right now. And if it goes above that, I will be treating it. Okay, thank you, Adam. Um, we've had a question from uh, Joseph who says that um, they've had COVID and noted ch noticed changes in concentration. So would this be temporary and caused by inflammation perhaps? Does anyone want to pose that one? So, I mean, I'm happy to answer this because I've worked on some of the COVID wards. Um, the, we, we can't say too much about the long term, how long COVID symptoms last for, but they do tend to affect multiple parts of the body and affect everybody differently. But in almost everybody, they do appear to resolve. In some people, they seem to last up to about six months. Okay. Thank you. Um, Adam, probably another quick one for you. Um, if we reduce blood pressure, would that repair the dementia issues? Yeah, so uh, this, is, this is a really important point. That blood pressure in your midlife determines your memory in later life. However, once you start developing high blood pressure-induced vascular dementia, and high blood pressure is the principle cause of vascular dementia even if you do treat the blood pressure you're not going to get much reversal of the damage to the brain because the damage is there already so this is very much a preventative uh, exercise which is, is that if you're in your 40s 50s 60s or even 70s and you want to remain well then get your blood pressure controlled and if you're on treatment take the medication Thank you. Um, I think, um, sorry, can I just? Of I course, think it's often a um, thing about reversing it. So we need to stop it. Reversing it, reversing the effects in the brain is is almost another level of treatment over stopping further damage, and being able to reverse those effects in the brain is is something that that is really difficult to do because you're bringing back neurons that are already dead is, is very, very difficult, whereas stopping that damage is a more, probably, a more realistic way of controlling what's going on. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, so we've had a question um, uh, that neither model system mentioned the impact of tau pathology, which again, we hear about amyloid and tau often when we talk about dementia. Um, so do either of you have any plans to incorporate the effects of tau pathology into your research models? Shall I go first? Um, so our, our model where we've looked at amyloid deposition, um, we have also looked at tau pathology. Um, we have seen some subtle changes in tau pathology when we get amyloid deposits. So there's, there's different schools of thought into what, what steps happen. So we tend to think that we get amyloid and then the amyloid causes the changes in tau that then leads to tau pathology. In different dementias, you get tau pathology without out without amyloid. So the two are linked, but there can be tau pathology on its own. So where we are looking at whether the amyloid deposition causes effects on tau, and that is something we are doing in that model. Um, it's not particularly easy, and it's one of our, the disadvantages, unfortunately, of the stem cell models, because the, um, the nerve cells that we make from stem cells 
are not particularly mature. If you think about the neurons in our brains, when we get Alzheimer's disease, we're 70, 80 years old. They've been around for a lot longer. Um, so you only start to see the mature form of the tau protein if you culture those cells for about six months. Um, so obviously in terms of um, working in a lab and doing projects, waiting six months for every set of data is, is an incredibly long time to wait, but we are trying. Thanks, Kate. Um, Adam, would your uh, would you like to input on that question about tau, or we can? No, move I think on? that's uh, really comprehensive. What Kate yeah. said. Great, thank you. Um, a question from Zoe: Is there a link between migraines and vascular dementia? So, um, again, this is intriguing because uh, obviously there are lots of different types of migraines, um, but migraine uh, migraine with aura is known to be a vascular condition um, and of course increasingly we're aware that dementia is also got vascular origins as well but to the best of my knowledge i can't say that there's a specific link between the two okay thanks adam um so sarah says in terms of the stem cell work would it be possible to take stem cells from someone with Alzheimer's disease to see any abnormalities? Yes, so we have um, lots of different lines as we call them, so every time we take stem cells from a person and can make them into cells we can use in the lab, we call that a different cell line. Um, there are, we have a range of different, different types of lines, so we there are stem cell lines that are from people with genetic Alzheimer's disease where there's a very clear genetic cause and that helps us investigate um, that disease. But then there's also the disease, the sporadic form of the disease that we call it where there's no genetic component. Now you can take the cell lines from people with Alzheimer's disease. The difficult thing with that is that even even two people who have Alzheimer's disease, even if they got it at the same age and had very similar clinical history, they have very different genetic makeup. So knowing what is due to the Alzheimer's disease and what is due to just variation in people genetically is really hard to determine. So it's, so there's a protein called apolipoprotein E and apolipoprotein if you have the E4 version of that protein, you're more, that's a risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. So the lines we're working with at the moment are these apolipoprotein E4 lines because they should give us a, a better idea of what goes on in Alzheimer's disease. But it, when the stem cell technology started, we thought it would be a very quick way to, to look at what causes Alzheimer's disease because we just thought we'd get a load of people who didn't have it, a load of people who did have it, take their stem cells, compare the difference, and it would give us all the answers. But there's just too much variability genetically between individuals to do that, um, unfortunately. Thanks, Kate. Nice. <laughs> um, probably another one for you, also from uh, Sarah, who asked that previous question um, about your uh, model. So does taking individual cell types to make that neurovascular unit reflect the complexity of the unit adequately? Um, yes and no. So it's, it's the best model we've got. Um, it uses human cell types. So it gives us a a way of looking at the disease in human cells in the laboratory. So it is a good model, but there are limitations with that model. And crucially, what we haven't been able to do yet is to get all the different cell types. So we have the brain support cells, we have one type, we have the astrocytes, we need to incorporate the other two support types in there. It's not straightforward because how many, what the ratio is of all those different cell types is really hard to get a handle on. And then the other really important factor which we are working on is that all these cells exist in an extracellular matrix. So you have the cells, but then they're surrounded um, by, by a matrix. And we use different um, gels kind of just like 
jellies to put the cells in to allow them to grow. But getting a the appropriate gel that reflects what is in our brain is really quite tricky as well. There are just so many components. So to put everything in, it gets really tricky. So we have to, to simplify it to a degree and then we work with our models, but understanding the limitations of our models um, in terms of what our data means is really important. Great, thanks Kate. And I think we've got time for maybe one more question for Adam. So uh, how early should a person check blood pressure and is early intervention the best way to reduce brain damage? So um, high, high blood pressure, so I'll answer the second part of the question first, because that's mm -hmm. easier. So the most effective way of preventing memory loss is by having a reasonable blood pressure. And um, the other part of that question, so how soon should you check it? You should, the, the most, one of the most accurate way of checking blood pressures now is to measure it at home using a validated device. So if you went to a pharmacy and you found a blood pressure machine, you asked the pharmacist whether it would be validated. <clears throat> they're, not, they're not expensive. They're not more than about 20 pounds. It's probably one of the best 20 pounds that you could probably invest in, in terms of your health. Um, and I, there was, I'd just like to take this opportunity to address the question above that. Is that okay, Josie? Of course, yeah, of course. So the, the question um, above David's, which is, have there been any studies shown on the increase of blood pressure due to exercise and its effect on dementia? The answer to that is that your blood pressure rises when you exercise, that's normal. But the more you exercise, the lower your blood pressure will be. So blood pressure is a composite of how healthy you are. So if you smoke, you don't exercise and your diet is poor, your blood pressure will go up. And as a consequence, you'll be damaging your brain. So more exercise is good and it will lower blood pressure. Great. Thank you both. Um, I think we'll have to um, leave it there for the questions. Sorry if we didn't get a chance to answer yours. Um, but I would just like to say thank you to Adam and Kate for such interesting talks and answering those questions today. It's been fantastic. Thank you both. And we'll say goodbye to you now right. as well. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for your questions and for listening. Bye. Thank you, for, thank you very much. Um, goodbye. And before everyone else leaves the call today, we've just got a couple more poll questions that we'd love for you to answer, just to give us a bit of uh, feedback and insight into how you found today. So those should be hopefully appearing on your screen any second. So did you find the content of the talks too technical, about right, or too simple? And would you recommend these Lab Notes events to your friends and family? And finally, have you learned something new today about dementia research? Uh, we will be sending a more detailed feedback survey to you. Um, so, but we just really like this as like a quick summary of how you found today. So I'll just wait for a couple more seconds while a few more people answer. And I'm gonna end those polls there. So we can see that most of you found it about right, which is perfect, and you would recommend those events. And you've all, most of you have also learned something new about dementia research. So that's absolutely brilliant. That's exactly what we want to hear. Um, so like I said, we will be sending a more detailed feedback survey to you tomorrow, and the video recording will probably come sometime next week. Uh, please do complete the survey as we really appreciate any feedback you can give us about the event. And we're also gathering input into our 2022 series in the survey. So please do tell us what you'd like to see from next year's Lab Notes series. So if there's any particular topics or areas of interest you'd like to hear about, we'd really love to hear from you too. So hopefully now you should be able to see some slides about our next Lab Notes, which will be on Thursday, the 11th of November at 2 p.m., where we'll hear from researchers in our Imperial College Network who will share their research into the links between sleep and dementia. So it should be really interesting. You can find out more about this event or sign up on our website to join us. Um, and I know there were some questions that we weren't able to answer today. 
uh, and somewhere you may need more personalised information or guidance on where to turn. And our Dementia Research info line is there to help. So they can answer questions and signpost to other sources of information and support. So please do get in touch with them if you need to, uh, using that number on the screen now. And as we close, uh, if you are interested in finding out more about donating in your will, please head over to our website. And thank you again for joining us today. I hope you found it interesting and useful and will join us for our final event in the series or join us next year. So thank you all and goodbye. <laughs>